Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm Christy Truesdale, Deputy Director of the Children's Environmental Health Network. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Creating and Using Knowledge to Protect Children's Environmental Health. This is the first webinar of our five-part series, Protecting Children's Environmental Health, the Blueprint in Action. I hope that you'll be joining us for our next uh, four webinars in this series coming in our upcoming months to learn about some of the other ambitious multidisciplinary efforts underway to address children's environmental health in the United States. Before we get started today, I'm going to address a few logistical items. First off, uh, you should all be able to view the slides from today's presentations through the ReadyTalk webinar plugin on your computer um, using the link provided to you in the registration confirmation email. Uh, all lines are muted and are going to remain muted throughout the presentation except for presenters. You can submit questions at any time using the chat box on the lower left hand side of uh, your screen and uh, we are going to do our best to answer as many of these questions as we can at the very end of our webinar after all speakers have presented. So this webinar uh, is being recorded and will be archived um, on the CEHN website by tomorrow for future use and sharing and the link will be shared with all of you via email. So I encourage uh, all of you to expand the conversation online. Share what you are learning from this webinar on Twitter using the hashtags ProtectKidsHealth and Children at the Center. And lastly, uh, we will be emailing you post-webinar with a link to a brief evaluation survey. So I encourage you to please uh, just take a minute to complete the, the brief survey so that we can use your feedback to help make this webinar series as meaningful and helpful as possible. So with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this webinar, Nseru Obat Witherspoon. Ms. Witherspoon is the Executive Director of the Children's Environmental Health Network, where she organizes, leads, and manages policy, education and training, and science-related programs. For the past 19 years, she has served as a key spokesperson for children's vulnerabilities and the need for their protection. Yeah, like I find that. Could, oh, I hear I somebody Starbucks speaking. One. If someone could. Well, if I'm at Starbucks, I'll do. Gen generally, a half hour per room. I don't want to be there forever. The conference yeah. has been someone. muted. All right, um, I'm hoping everyone can hear me. For the past 19 years, NSA has served as a key spokesperson for children's vulnerabilities and the need for their protection, conducting presentations and lectures across the country. She is a leader in the field of children's environmental health, serving as a past member of the NIH Council of Councils, on the Science Advisory Board for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the External Science Board for the Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes NIH research work. She is a co-leader for advancing the Science Health Initiative of the National Collaborative on a Cancer-Free Economy Network. Ms. Witherspoon is also a board member for the Pesticide Action Network of North America, the Environmental Integrity Project, and she serves on the Maryland Children's Environmental Health Advisory Council. Ense? Hi there. Can everyone hear me? Christy? I can hear you. Okay, good. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for taking your time out today. We know everyone's time is very precious, but uh, we really do believe that you will have some great knowledge uh, and hopefully some good ideas that come out of today's discussion. We'd like to thank our wonderful presenters, who I will introduce in a minute. Uh, again, this is uh, one of a five-part webinar series that the Children's Environmental Health Network is organizing over the course of this year. And this is part of our Children at the Center, our Children's Environmental Health Movement. 
quick background here is that a few uh, years ago we released what's called the Blueprint for Protecting Children's Environmental Health, an Urgent Call to Action. That blueprint is found on our website, www.cehn.org. And the whole purpose is to create a leadership forum and opportunity where multi-sectors, multi-disciplines contribute to not only in the creation of that blueprint but moving forward this field, the growth of this field of protecting children in all places where they spend majority of their time learning, living, playing, um, and just being. Um, and it's extremely important and, and we're very proud of that uh, report and there are certain themes that have come out of as far as course priority levels of work. These webinars will be aligned with those themes. Uh, that's why this very first one is fundamental and this is really you know, mobilizing science, the importance of science in our field and mobilizing into actual action, fundamental strategies, standards, recommendations, um, advocacy opportunities that are benefiting children and certainly their families and their broader community. So with no further ado, we will get uh, started here and I will introduce our first speaker, well all of our speakers and then um, we'll get going with each presentation. And then of course as a reminder there is the chat box so as you're hearing and have thoughts please do type in your questions and we'll do our best at the end of all three to then address them and have a pretty good uh, conversation here with our speakers. First, Dr. Tracy Woodruff is a recognized expert on environmental pollution exposures during pregnancy and effects on prenatal and child health, as well as on her innovations in, translation, in translating and communicating science findings for clinical and policy audiences. Her research includes evaluating prenatal exposures to ch environmental chemicals and related adverse pregnancy outcomes and characterizing developmental risks. She has authored numerous scientific publications and book chapters and has been quoted widely in the press, including USA Today, the San Francisco Chronicle, and WebMD. She was previously at the US EPA, where she was a senior scientist and policy advisor in the Office of Policy and the author of numerous government documents. She's an associate editor of Environmental Health Perspectives, and she was appointed by the Governor of California in 2012 to the Science Advisory Board of the Developmental, Developmental and Productive Toxicant, otherwise known as DART, Identification Committee. Our second speaker, Dr. Linda McCauley, is the Dean of the Emory's ne uh, Nell Hodson Woodruff School of Nursing, a member of the National Academy of Medicine and the American Academy of Nursing. Dr. McCauley's research, in research interests excuse me, include exposure to children to pesticides, the special health risks to adolescent workers, and interventions to decrease pesticide exposures in vulnerable populations. Most recently, the conference has been unmuted. Most recently, her work focuses on climate change and health risks associated with occupational heat exposure in vulnerable populations. In 2016, she secured federal funding to create the Children's Environmental Health Center at Emory University. The center, the first of its kind in the southeast and the first to be led by a nurse, brings together the expertise of four Emory University schools and aims to explore how environmental exposures prior to conception during prenatal development and postnatally may affect infant health and health. And then finally, Nathan Mutik is the Center Administrator for the Emory University Center for Children's Health and the Environment, the Microbiome Metabolism and project manager for the Southeast Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit, also known as PACU. He is a founding member of the Children's Environmental Health Social Media Working Group, work group which is a collaborative <laughs> effort between centers at University of Southern California, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, Emory University, and the Southeast PACU. The primary goal of the social media work group is creating and enhancing capacity across the centers and patients network for utilizing social media for community outreach and translation. He is involved in the development and implementation of multiple community outreach and research translation programs, including the You Better Live Better Environmental Health Social Impact Campaign. And with that, I'd like to pass us over to Dr. Tracy Woodruff. All right, can you hear me, Ante? Yes. Excellent. Hey, Hello, everyone. Hi. Thank you for um, 
asking me to speak today. So this is a really very important topic, and it's great to be a partner with the Children's Environmental Health Network. We've done a lot of important work together, and I look forward to more important work because we have a lot to do. So I'm going to give an overview first about the work that the government's supporting around children's environmental health research and research translation primarily through the uh, US EPA NIH S funded children's centers. And one of the uh, reasons that we are seeing such an important interest in children's environmental health is because children um, could be healthier. This is from a report that US EPA and NIH has put out talking about the importance of the children's environmental health centers. And in it, they note some of the statistics about children's health today, which is that we're seeing an increased incidence of a number of different chronic health conditions among children, including um, increases in certain childhood cancers like leukemia, um, increases in neurodevelopmental outcomes. So Tracy, we're, yes. did you hit star seven? Oh, did I not hit star seven? I think some people are not able to hear. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Hmm. Um, we can hear did you, you hear me before? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we we heard your whole presentation earlier. Okay. okay. Well, I apologize about that. No, nah, that's okay. Some people I'll cannot just, hear. Okay. I'll uh, just keep, let me know if you can't hear. All right, thank you. Um, anyway, so we're the obesity, diabetes, and a number of different chronic conditions, and some estimates suggest that about half of children suffer some, from some type of chronic condition, even though childhood should be a time when kids are healthy. Um, and the impact of children's uh, health and the environmental impacts on children's health have a significant impact on society. Uh, these are some uh, facts from the report that talk about the cost of some of these um, different types of diseases, whether it's cancer, um, environmentally related diseases, asthma, IQ, or autism. There are the cost, just the monetary costs to, to society are in the millions to billions of dollars. And we know that we can uh, see the links between certain types of environmental exposures and um, adverse chronic conditions or adverse outcomes in children. And these are some other facts that come from that NIHS EPA report talking about how uh, much or what percent of different types of childhood conditions we know are linked to different types of environmental exposure, whether it's premature births attributable to air pollution, um, the percent of acute respiratory infections in children worldwide related to environmental conditions, which is over half the contribution of air pollution to deaths among children under five years old around the world, which is 600,000. And just to note, air pollution, along with other industrial pollutants, uh, represent the biggest cause of mortality worldwide. And that a lot of factors, a lot of health outcomes that we thought we know have a genetic contribution, we now know the genetic contribution is um, not as great as we had thought previously, and autism is a good example of that. Um, it was thought that 90% of autism was contributable to genetics, but now we know it's far less. So one of the things that's also been going up over the same period where we've seen an increase in chronic uh, uh, childhood conditions is the production of chemicals in the United States. And this is from data that we have published quite widely that's collected by the U.S. federal government from the U.S. Federal Reserve Board, and it shows that chemical production starting in the 1950s has increased over 15-fold, and now we have many different types of industrial pollutants in our everyday products, whether it's mattresses, plastics, pans, or food containers, which contain chemicals which can adversely impact our health. And uh, this is data from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, which uh, records how much chemicals are imported or manufactured in the United States, and it's quite a lot. Uh, there's over 9 trillion pounds of chemicals that are imported or used in the United States, so it's about 30,000 pounds of chemicals per person. So it's inevitable that we're exposed to many different types of chemicals 
um, starting all the way um, in utero. So the Children's Environmental Centers, which are jointly funded by the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, were created in 1998, uh, shortly after the executive order by uh, then President Clinton recognizing the importance of children's environmental health that was issued in 1997. The network is designed to uh, promote science and multidisciplinary collaborations and because the diseases we're trying to understand and prevent are multifactorial and require a multidisciplinary approach to understand what the contributions are from the environment. But they also have a very important component to accelerate translation um, and to communicate the science. And every center has a community engagement uh, component, which I know will be discussed more later, but the goal is to really do science and then get that science out to have it make a difference for children's, for children's health. Um, there's also cross-foster collaboration, so you already heard that some of the centers work together around social media. And the overall goal is to reduce the burden of childhood disease as a result of exposure to harmful environmental contaminants. Um, there are multiple centers across the country. Um, this is a map of current, former, um, and EPA-funded centers. And you can see that they span uh, multiple locations across the United States. And here's Emory right here, which is uh, great to have them jo joined us recently in 2008. I will note that uh, center funding is running out. Um, our center, for example, at UCSF, funding ended last year, as well as a number of other centers that came online at the same time. And there are currently no plans to renew center funding um, by EPA or NIHS. So the center findings have led to important child health improvements. So one of the centers worked, has done a lot of work showing uh, looking at arsenic and the importance of arsenic on children's health, but importantly, is have done a lot of work about how rice is an uh, important source of arsenic, particularly for children, since often children eat that as a first food. They've done a lot of work with the FDA to create uh, regulatory limits for arsenic and infant rice cereal. The centers, a number of centers have done work on chlorpyrifos, which is an organophosphate pesticide. The science from the centers was extremely critical to the ban that EPA announced in 2016. I will note that this administration revoked that ban. They were sued and the court said that EPA can't revoke the ban, so that's still going on in process. But Hawaii went ahead and banned chlorpyrifos, was the first state in the United States to do so. Um, state of California also has declared chlorpyrifos a developmental and reproductive toxicant, which happened last year. Um, California has made um, important changes to flammability standards in terms of banning flame retardants in furniture. There's also been uh, other work um, around flame retardants. A lot of that has come from science from the, from the centers. So children's centers cover a number of different types of exposure from air pollution, agricultural chemicals, contaminated food and water, pesticides. Some of them look at the intersection with stress to address issues around environmental justice and health disparities synthetic materials, and we um, evaluate different windows of susceptibility, whether it's during gestation, um, childhood, and adolescence. And these are the birth outcomes, as you can see, are a range of the same outcomes that we see increasing in the population, whether it's met metabolic outcomes, neuro neurological outcomes, et cetera. So our center um, sits in the program on reproductive health and the environment. I'm the director of the program on reproductive health and the environment. We're in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences here at UCSF. The mission of our program is to create a healthier environment for human reproduction and development through uh, scientific research, clinical care, and improved health policies to prevent harmful chemical exposures. So our center follows that model. We um, integrate uh, work with a science, a basic science lab. Uh, we work with Dr. Susan Fisher, who is a world-known expert on placental biology. Um, we're trying to understand how industrial chemicals affect placental biology as a pathway by which we see adverse health outcomes 
um, from fetal development and birth outcomes. We look at exposures in terms of biomonitoring, both understanding maternal and fetal exposures, both during pregnancy um, and, and then at birth. And we're looking at both targeted chemicals, so perfluorinated chemicals and flame retardant chemicals, as well as advancing newer technologies to screen for suspect chemicals. And then we, our cohort, we work with here at UCSF as a diverse cohort from both public hospital, public catchment hospital, as well as our hospital, our hospital here on campus. So we have women who are very wealthy in our population and women who are very um, who are very low income in our population, and we're able to uh, understand uh, and look at differences in exposures and uh, stress to understand how they may interact to increase the risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes. We also have a very um, high proportion of Latinas uh, in our population, which helps us understand and study a group that's not been well studied or well represented in NIH research. And the key part to our center is to take what we've learned and to translate it so that we can get quicker action in the policy arena to address toxic environmental chemicals. We are, which I will talk a little bit more, working primarily through engagement with the clinical community. And our ultimate goal is to improve the health of infants and children. So our uh, area that we have focused on is to connect the science that we do as well as the other centers, as well as the rest of the scientific community, to the clinical community because clinicians are an important advocate for health on behalf of their patients. And the, um, our, essentially our, mm, our theory of change or our model that we look through is we do research that's focused on what are the knowledge gaps that would, would help us advance our efforts to protect children's health through policy engagement? So where are there gaps in terms of uh, designing public policy? We engage with influential leaders, particularly influential leaders as partners in uh, addressing environmental health issues. We do a lot of communication around science, but it also how do we synthesize the available science so that it's meaningful for people to take action on? And then we have direct engagement with uh, both the clinical community and policymakers. So the group that we have been focused on working with is the obstetric gynecology community. Why do we work with OBGYNs? Well, they're a very important partner for our work because they have regular and unique contact with women. So many women see their OBGYN provider as their primary care physician, not just during um, critical times, for example, during pregnancy. And also, our, the focus of our center is on pregnancy as the um, uh, window of vulnerability. And pregnancy is also the time that women are seeing their, their um, obstetrician and it's also a time that women are very, uh, it's a teachable moment. Women are, are looking to make changes to improve the health of their, of their child. And you can intervene during pregnancy. And because pregnancy is such an important uh, time of vulnerability, changes that you make, whether it's an individual change or a public policy that's meant to protect uh, the fetal development or the prenatal period, will be low enough to, to uh, provide a benefit to everyone in the population. So it's an efficient way for us to address uh, policy, uh, policy interventions by focusing on the prenatal period. And finally, working with doctors is um, important because they add an authoritative voice to the public policy arena. Um, doctors have a personal relationship, as well as nurses have a personal relationship with their patients and people inherently trust Someone has told me this, they trust doctors and nurses more than maybe they trust scientists. So that's good to have them as a partner. Um, so when we first started doing this work, I'm in an OBGYN department, and we first started working at, uh, I was first at UCSF, and we first started our center. Um, amazingly or interestingly, there was little to no um, environmental health awareness among the OBGYN community. And so, it, what our goal was was to create, to take advantage of some aha moments to make that connection between 
the robust science that we have about the importance of environmental exposure during pregnancy and connect it to the community, the OBGYN community, who um, is a critical partner in making a difference on this topic. So here are some of the things that happened to make to, that made this happen. So one of the first things that actually happened was in 2008, there was, I think some of the centers was involved in this too, uh, a, a study on lead in lipstick and uh, there was also a bill introduced into the California legislature to address lead in lipstick, and because lipstick is a women's uh, health issue, the, um, the advocates who are working on this reached out to the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the local chapter here in California, and the woman on the left here is Dr. Jeannie Connery, who was the president, and they asked her, they said, so what do you think about this lead in lipstick bill? And she's like, had no idea what they were talking about. She's just wasn't sure what to think, and she then thought, oh, we should turn to, and that actually at that time we were starting to work with ACOG, so she looked to us to help her with it because we're from UCSF, which is a well-respected clinical sciences institution. The other issue that um, made this, uh, connected the importance of chemical exposures uh, to, in the physician's mind, was that they are very familiar with these chemicals on top, estradiol, obviously OBGYNs know a lot about estrogen, and then diethylsilvestrol, which was a cautionary tale about what happens when you have a, a pharmaceutical chemical that you give during pregnancy because this chemical OBGYNs prescribed during pregnancy thinking it would prevent preterm birth. It didn't prevent preterm birth, and it led to a lot of um, um, because the exposures occurred during, in utero, led to a lot of reproductive health outcomes in the children. Some of them were rare vaginal cancers, not discovered until the daughters were quite older. But if you look at these chemical structures, and then you say, oh, and look about this chemical that we uh, care about in environmental health, BPA, doctors see right away, oh my God, these things look the same. They probably do act the same, and we know that BPA is an estrogenic substance. This isn't actually the first time I've had this conversation with a doctor at UCSF. I just had one with the woman who's now the new head of the department, chair of the Department of Surgery, who's made this same analogy between thyroids and uh, polybrominated diphenyl ether. So it's very compelling to compare uh, the structure of chemicals to in industrial chemicals, which really are very similar. The other thing was to show them the science. They just were unaware of the science. This is from a study that we published showing that uh, pregnant women are exposed to multiple industrial chemicals all at the same time. This is a, another aha moment for physicians. Uh, they really had no idea that pregnant women or that people were exposed to all these different chemicals. They just hadn't thought about it and, it, you know, they perceived that the chemicals were inert and stayed in their product, but this is obviously not true. So this was another important feature for that, for us to talk about this issue is to published studies showing the multiple chemical exposures and then communicate it to our audience. And then the other um, aspect that was very compelling for our clinical engagement or engaging with our clinical partners was that they, again, doctors are very used to pharmaceuticals. They know how pharmaceutical regulation works. They know that if somebody wants to make a pharmaceutical, it has to go through uh, this uh, all the testing here, they have to develop the pharmaceutical, goes through in vitro and in vivo testing, it has to go through randomized controlled trials, and then it can go on the marketplace. Here's what happens with environmental chemicals, which is they're produced and then they go on the marketplace, and then we decide if they're a problem or not. This was illuminating that they thought that the government was already regulating chemicals or products that people could go into the store and buy. And this is actually true for most of the public. Doesn't realize that the chemicals that the government doesn't regulate these, and this was also quite compelling. Um, so one thing that we also are uh, try and do is take advantage of moments and opportunities in time when we have I like to say here star alignment. So Dr. Jeannie Connery, who started to get engaged with us because she was uh, the local, was the president of the California chapter of the ACOG, um, became the president of, a, of the National American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in 2013. Also, Dr. Linda Judis, who is the chair of my department, or was the chair of my department here at UCSF, 
became the president of the American Society of Reproductive Medicine. So we took that opportunity for them to make this, they both made this an issue um, during their presidency, environmental reproductive health, and they um, issued this committee opinion. So a committee opinion, which comes out of a, these health professional societies, are extremely critical. They form the base, they represent a synthesis of the current science on a clinical topic, and then they provide recommendations on how to address it, and they form the basis of their educational system, their um, clinical guidelines, or clinical uh, consultations, and they then also are critical because then they can uh, give the opinion by which they then do their engagement around public policy, and, and sometimes, and this group happens to lobby. So, um, they published a committee opinion in 2013 from a joint opinion from these two profession health professional societies saying that the evidence of exposure to toxic environmental agents and adverse reproductive and developmental health outcomes is robust. So that is saying that science is ready for them to take action. And secondly, they said we need timely action to identify and reduce exposure to toxic environmental agents. So. Um, this also led to um, their work because ACOG is also represented in an international consortium of OBGYN societies from over 120 countries around the globe. They then took the issue of environmental reproductive health to FIGO, which is the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetricians, and they too adopted a similar scientific consensus statement with more specific recommendations which were to, which are to advocate for policies to prevent exposures to toxic environmental exposures. So the very first recommendation is around public policies because those create systemic changes that benefit the whole population. Um, work for a healthy food system, make environmental health part of health care, and then champion environmental justice because of the differing exposures and higher exposures for communities of color and low-income communities. Uh, so then the last part is this. So they recognize this, but also for one of the keys in terms of engaging the clinical community about science is to make our science understandable to them. So we work in observational human studies and animal studies, and clinicians are really trained on randomized controlled clinical trials and also the methods to synthesize that literature, which is not quite the same as how um, we, at the time, it synthesized our literature. So they synthesized their evidence base is uh, through the Cochrane Collaboration and GRADE, which are systematic review frameworks, which are a transparent, consistent application of evaluating the evidence and coming up with a bottom line summary of what it says. We, um, because we needed to create the same value for the environmental health field, use the methods from the clinical medicine to develop a method to apply to our environmental health science, mostly human observational studies and animal studies, which is called the Navigation Guide Systematic Review Methodology. It uh, has been actually very successful. It's been um, um, uptaked by the National Academy of Sciences and discussed in, and recommended in three of their reports. The World Health Organization and the International Labor Organization are currently using the Navigation Guide to evaluate um, occupational exposures to estimate the burden of disease for occupational exposures worldwide. And here's an example of how the, this was used. We did a systematic review of exposure to polybrominated diphenyl ethers, which is a flame retardant during pregnancy and IQ, and we actually evaluated studies that came from three of the children's centers, so you can see the children's centers are producing this data, we were able to synthesize it and come up with a robust finding that these chemicals are a presumed hazard to human intelligence through reduction in IQ. This has been very successful um, because also we've shown that PBDEs, because they've been phased out and banned, are declined, so it's effective the policy, public policies. But this science, both those pieces of science, we're able to take and you can work with clinicians. This is Dr. Maria Zlatnik, who's part of our center, Dr. Mina Singla, who's our science and policy director, 
um, published the study, and then it became fed into an ordinance where San Francisco has banned flame retardants, not just in furniture, but in all uh, materials in the city. Um, uh, actually in furniture, and this went on to become a state law, so California has uh, banned flame retardant, all flame retardant chemicals in furniture. So you can see that that has been very successful. Um, so I just want to say that doctors, um, conti we work, continue to work with physicians, they, um, can make an important difference in, in, this, in helping us convey messages around chemicals and efforts to improve policies that incorporate science and to reduce chemi harmful chemical exposures. So Jeannie Connery is now actually going to be the president of FIGO and Environmental Reproductive Health is one of her issues, so we've had a lot of global uptake on this. And here you can see Linda, Dr. Linda Judy, who just recently testified in the California legislature on toxic chemicals and consumer products. So we continue to engage with our clinical partners in this area. So I'm going to conclude. Um, so we know that environmental exposures are important contributors to child disease. Investing in the research of the children's centers and translation has been critical. We wouldn't have had some of these important changes without this research. So um, as I mentioned, funding is there is currently no funding for, new, for, for renewing the centers, and the center's funding is running out. So we hope that something will happen about that. Um, that's what he says. We need government investment in research to help healthy children. So with that, I'd like to thank all our funders. And you can follow us. Oh, I spelled that wrong. That's UCSF, not CUSF. But anyway, I'm sure you can figure it out. Uh, you can follow us and we uh, on our various media channels. So thank you. Thank you so much. The conference has been muted. Thank you so much. Very informative uh, set of examples, case examples. I hope a lot of you got energized. Uh, Dr. Woodruff and her team have been working for years uh, to help really be wonderful translational agents of such important research and information for proactive um, involvement in adv advocating for, for better you know, communities and health, particularly that of um, reproductive health and child health. So thank you so much. Now we will move on to uh, Dr. McCauley, and if you could please make sure that you unmute yourself at star seven. As you hear, we've been having a bit of trouble with folks uh, staying on mute, so we've now muted all lines again, and each speaker will now just have to unmute themselves by star seven. Thank you. So this is Linda McCauley. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great. So um, this is wonderful to follow Tracy's presentation. Uh, I think the, our different aspects of doing uh, valuable work in the area of children's environmental health, while we are under the same umbrella, the Children's Environmental Health Centers, I think you'll get a flavor of the difference, differences in the two centers. And what I want to really focus about is uh, with the center here at Emory University is how it's designed not only to create knowledge, but also to use knowledge in meaningful ways. And whereas Tracy talked about uh, the engagement with the uh, physician and medical community and affecting health policy, I think um, in the following presentation you'll get a different flavor where we're going to focus on more about how we connect with um, the communities in Atlanta through meaningful engagement. So now, just as Tracy uh, described, the Children's Center's funding is ending. We have had the benefit of having three and a half years of funding. Right now, it looks like in six more months, this important center that was formed in, in Atlanta, Georgia, um, we'll have no further funding. So I want you to think about the impact of this funding on the communities that we're working with. First of all, uh, we were very proud of being the first children's center located in the Deep South and focused entirely on African-American women, their pregnancies, and their babies. 
And so the science that we're trying to do is basically in, in this urban southern city to document what exposures are happening to these pregnant women and their children. It's really quite amazing that these hundreds, we're, we're really uh, recruiting 600 pregnant women and following them through their pregnancies and birth, have no idea of what their exposures are. Uh, whether they are exposed to pesticides in their home, whether it is um, flame retardants, whether it's insecticides, they don't know what they're exposed to. And so we're helping them find answers to those questions. And then we're also focusing on um, the microbiome, uh, what happens to their, the role of this the microbes in our body in terms of either helping us uh, detoxify chemicals or perhaps working in combination with chemicals to actually have effects on different body systems, particularly the brain. And then the third area is we're looking at how these exposures in the microbiome might actually contribute to prematurity and infant neurodevelopment. We do know that in this Atlanta sample, the prematurity rate is about 17%. So just as we expected to find with African-American women who are um, disproportionately at risk for preterm labor um, uh, and preterm birth, uh, we are finding that already in our um, population. But I really uh, am not going to be concentrating on our research today, but more, more about how we're engaging with the community. Um, and the context of where we're situated in the Deep South is important. Uh, the, this context is, um, really sets up the type of engagement that uh, we have to design with communities, because we don't have a very positive history. From uh, being the South has been the focus area for um, just horrendous pollution problems. Uh, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, our communities in Atlanta are still very suspicious of research and science. And then uh, in Atlanta, we know the Proctor Creek watershed is just one example of polluted areas in the metro Atlanta area. And so when we were funded to begin this work as a center, we, we stepped very carefully in our developing network uh, with our communities, not knowing how they would perceive us and the work that we were doing. But you can see on this next slide, as we began this, uh, this work, how we reached out in a very broad way to many, many different types of stakeholders. See Kim Square is actually the name of our center, uh, Children's Environmental Health, uh, the Microbiome, Metabolomics are part of what we're looking at. And so you can see on this slide that we have business partners, and these are um, small businesses that are led by uh, African American uh, residents in Atlanta. We have nonprofit groups working with us. We have uh, government entities, uh, academic entities, uh, and healthcare providers. Uh, so a, a, a rich mix. We benefited from um, having another center here at Atlanta that is focused on environmental exposures in a broad sense, um, but they did not have a subgroup that was focused on children and pregnancy. So we were able to bring that uh, to the work that's going on here in Atlanta and at Emory University. So one of the things that we learned right away is to be humble as we worked with this community and to respect the um, knowledge that they were bringing to the researchers. And 
uh, we had written the initial grant from this center with an idea of how we might engage in the community, and quite frankly, they were respectful for what we had described, but they were uh, very quick to tell us that they really felt like we were um, perhaps going in a wrong direction, and we listened to them in terms of um, what they believed we should do to educate the community on how the environment affects their health. And they encouraged us to focus almost, in, um, almost entirely on social media. And I think that's one of the things we learned from community engagement is where as a researcher we can think that we know where the science and the knowledge needs to go, but many times the community know uh, the people the best, and they are the wisest and smartest in terms of telling us what to do. So we're going to talk a little bit about the social media campaign that they actually have uh, led and designed and worked with us. Also, um, I think it's important to realize uh, many of the families that we're working with are um, lower income families that have issues with violence in their community, unemployment, violence, substance abuse, and um, they've given us a lot of helpful information about how they view environmental exposures in the context of all the other social um, problems that they're living with every day. So to give you an example, it would be very hard to mobilize a campaign to reduce phthalate exposures in this population of mothers and babies when the, the families might be facing homelessness or other types of housing insecurity. So the social impact campaign that we've launched is No Better, Live Better. Uh, this logo was designed by um, the women and other stakeholders in our community. You can see the mother and the baby, and, and you can see the microbiome that's shared between the mother and the baby. And um, they own this logo, and they're quick to tell you this, this is them. This is not Emory University. This is the Atlanta community. And um, it's, it's designed to bring environmental health literacy to African-American women in very culturally appropriate ways. So just as, as Tracy described how the important outreach to the health, pro health providers in the San Francisco area, we have examples of things that we're doing with flame retardant, education around flame retardants to uh, our African American families that we're working with in the communities. We also have branded ambassadors who are African American stars in the city of Atlanta who have name recognition for their position. Many of them are media um, celebrities who have joined with us to, to push environmental health uh, information out to the community. So we've done uh, video and print ads that are also pushed out through social media. We also have informational wrap cards that we put in places where people in the community can see them. But all of the content on these materials are designed by our stakeholder advisory board with input from the community. We also, <coughs> in partnership with our community groups, have designed a number of small research grant, not research grants, but community grants that have gone to different entities in the Atlanta area to develop different types of ed outreach and educational programs. So the Center for Black Women's Wellness has received one of these grants to develop educational materials. We've also been able to fund teachers in the metro Atlanta schools to push out environmental health uh, messages and different types of projects. So 
So in addition to our stakeholders, we've also looked for other groups that have been doing environmental health uh, work for a number of years and leverage uh, partnerships. So one of our major partnerships is PESU, which is the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit in uh, Region 8 of the uh, EPA, EPA eight, I'm sorry, Region 4 um, in the EPA. And so this has been really great that we're not working in isolation, that we are dovetailing our work with the work of PESU and because they have outreach with uh, a lot of communities, uh, sheltering arms or daycare centers, uh, they are developing uh, educational materials for a lot of different um, um, groups that support families. So we found that these partnerships have actually helped get the word out about what our center is doing. And this is one of the most distressing things to me in terms of the uh, possibility of the funding for these centers ending. Uh, whereas researchers have a lot of different ways to find funding sources for their research projects, this type of um, community outreach and partnership this is such an essential part of these environmental health centers, children's environmental health centers, that when the funding for the center ends, these communities are left without the partnerships and support to maintain the momentum for um, the work that they've started. And it's, uh, it's so disappointing to everyone to, to actually lose momentum, they're going to have to start looking for other groups to fund them versus continuing to reach out and educate uh, families with young children. Here's just an, an, another example of the uh, PESU partnership. Uh, we were able to uh, uh, partner with PESU using their funding to uh, engage our stakeholders in their Break the Cycle project, which is uh, really reaching out to the youth in the community. This is a picture of some of the uh, young people that have been working to address environmental issues in their community and advocate for their local government change. And, and a lot of these um, you know, they learn about the environment, but they also learn about leadership and power. And this is just a picture of a group that learned, that earned a citizen science award. You can change the lives of youth. They'll become your advocates for the future, and it's just critically important. So I want to talk a few minutes about uh, the difference um, and the challenges with um, translating research to action in the community. And when we were funded in this center, we had investigators from the School of Public Health, from nursing, from medicine, from arts and sciences. Many of these scientists had never worked with communities before. They're phenomenal scientists, state-of-the-art methods, um, really being able to push out their findings in scientific journals, in scientific meetings, but they really had never worked with uh, stakeholder advisory boards or uh, worked with uh, translating their research findings into um, meaningful messages to the community. And so a lot of the work we've done is helping scientists understand citizen science, engagement of communities, and this is not always easy. Um, to give you an example, we are just now getting uh, research results from our study. So for example, we know now what exposures the women in Atlanta have, and we want to push out the message to the community about their 
exposure to flame retardants or their exposure to different other types of endocrine disrupting community uh, endo, uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals or what their exposure to pesticides are. And it's really quite controversial in terms of how to report back results to the community. So we've had a lot of discussions among our research team about our philosophy about sharing results to the community. And for example, if um, if you're a scientist and you're trying to study what is happening when you you give when you empower families to change behaviors, in a way you're disrupting what the scientists might have seen if there had not been any intervention, educational intervention. And so we have to discuss the importance of doing that. Um, what the research participants uh, want in terms of information about studies and the environment, uh, who, who the data belong to, um, who we're sharing biological samples with, all of these things are important. And so the participant, the research participants perceptions are important. The investigator has their perception about, many times an investigator will say, I don't know the meaning of these data. I can't, I can't explain what this finding means to the families, and therefore they are hesitant to share the information. Our review boards that oversee all the ethical issues around our research uh, provide massive oversight in terms of what we share and what we don't share. And then the funders sometimes have very explicit expectations of sharing research funding, uh, research findings. And so because not most of our research team had not ever really done any citizen science or community-based participatory research, we're having to educate every step of the way in terms of our philosophy. But some of our guiding principles have been is that the, the health data and the environmental data that we are collecting on these 600 women and their babies belong to the community. And our work has been bolstered by a recent report that came out of the uh, National Academy of Medicine on returning individual research results to participants. And, um, and so we, we have many discussions about the timing of returning results, what will be group results, what will be individual results. And um, because we're looking at so many exposures and so many health outcomes, um, it's, it's very important. We also, because we have so many health providers on our research team, one of the things that we, uh, principles that guide us is that while research participants may be someone's patient, we're conducting research, we're not providing patient care. And therefore, some of the guidance in terms of, a, of a physician or nurse sharing patient information is different in, than sharing research information. We do completely protect individual research data. We never disclose individual research results in any way that a person could be identified, but we feel strongly that communities will grow stronger if they can see the grouped information about um, their health status and the environmental threats in the community. So in conclusion, this is a work in progress. Uh, and I think we are learning a lot about uh, generating new knowledge that could be very powerful to the African American community here in Atlanta and, and could be uh, disseminated uh, to a larger audience, but that it is, um, if there are distinct challenges as we uh, discovered information and decide in what way to share it, 
and uh, the community perspective is extremely important, even if it was not. Some of our studies, the protocols were set up before we were funded at the Children's Center, so uh, they didn't consider reporting back to the community, and so now we're adding that layer of complexity into the work that we're doing. And even now, these children's centers are pulling their data to go to large national studies, the ECHO um, analysis, whose study is an example of one, and it's when you pull, you take biological samples from diverse communities and you pull them into a, a national uh, study, what happens to the informed consent and the um, ownership of the data and how is report back to the community handled? And then a, another thing that we issue is when we give a pilot research award uh, that's based on this cohort, do the, these young investigators who get pilots understand our community engagement and the expectation to translate their work back to the community. So I also want to acknowledge the vast number of investigators that are involved in these centers. The people from the community are listed here. The multiple areas of funded research that um, go into this. So I want to turn it over now to Nathan. Uh, NC, do you want to say anything before he starts with his piece? No, please. Go ahead and thank you so much. We, I alluded to our social media campaign, and Nathan's going to describe some of this work in more detail. Okay, um, thanks so much. Um, so I'm going to talk today about some of the efforts of the Children's Environmental Health Social Media Working Groups and what we've done to leverage the Children's Centers and PESU's existing network to help disseminate children's environmental health knowledge on social media. And so um, my goals today are to just briefly talk about why you would want to use social media and, and how it is an appropriate and effective tool for public health communication, and then describe our approach for disseminating the research and share some of the resources that we've developed in our group. Um, so just to start out with the why, um, I think most of us anecdotally could walk into a restaurant and look around and and notice how many folks are staring at their phones even though they're there with their friends and family. And so um, that for our group is enough. Um, but there's a lot of evidence around the use of social media um, and its effectiveness and how many people are, are on it currently. So Pew did a really great um, study on social media use in 2018. And what they found was that it's just an increasingly common and important tool for public health outreach and communication. Um, their report showed that over 70% of U.S. adults are accessing the Internet and they're using Facebook at a rate of about 76%. Um, and those users are typically using the site daily. Um, you can also see here that there's um, a tremendous amount of U.S. adults that are on Pinterest, Twitter, um, and, and quite a few on YouTube. Um, and so interestingly, um, Part of Pew's study was to look at the social media use by um, different racial groups and then also by income. And what you find when you look across race and income um, is that the results are fairly consistent. So um, pretty much across the board, um, people are consuming information on social media. And when you look at these trends, it really looks like um, this phenomenon is going to persist for the foreseeable future. Um, and then I think relevant to our work specifically is that people are using social media as a significant source of getting their science information. And so in this report, um, what you can see documented is that 33% uh, of U.S. adults are getting their science news on social media channels, and 44% of adults say that they are getting um, information and science news on social media that they just wouldn't find in other places. And so in light of those findings, um, we feel that a strong argument can be made that social media is an effective tool for outreaching diverse audiences with information that they can hopefully use to improve their health and the health of their children. Um, and so this brings us to our work specifically. Um, so this is a team effort. Um, none of this would be possible 
without the work of Wendy Gutschow and Brenda Kester and Roxana Chica um, from University of Southern California, Illinois, and Emory, respectively. Um, we've also had a lot of support from Emily Swick at the Region 5 PESU. Um, and so just briefly, our group met uh, at a joint meeting of the centers and PESUs in 2017. And the timing of this lined up with the publication of the NIEHS and EPA Children's Environmental Health um, Disease Research Report that uh, Tracy alluded to in her presentation. Um, we kind of started out, you know, going through some of the findings from that report. And so it just came out, um, the COTC groups and, and research translation groups from the PESUs were, um, got together and we had a common goal that we wanted to help disseminate that information. And so um, we actually, you know, in conversations about how we would approach that and landing on social media, um, looked to the work of the Children's Environmental Health Network with the social media toolkit that's put out for Children's Environmental Health Day as a starting point for developing our approach. And so our goals um, are fairly simple and straightforward. We want to create and enhance capacity across the Children's Centers and PACES network for using social media as a platform for community outreach and education. We want to increase engagement across the network and then also increase engagement with target communities and the general public. And so the primary way that we've approached this um, and what most of our work is centered around is translating that impact report into um, social media content that can then be disseminated by the various centers and paces. And so we kind of view ourselves and, and part of our work as doing some of the heavy lifting of that translation and making sure things are organized and easy for the centers and PACES to disseminate so we can take some of that workload off of the staff at, at those different organizations. And so we um, put out monthly content. Um, we try to align our content with other national public health themes. Um, so some of the past work that we've done has been sharing information from the impact report on exposures like BPA, phthalates, um, and flame retardants. Um, we've also focused on health outcomes, such as autism and asthma. Um, some upcoming themes that we're getting ready to publish material on is the endocrine disrupting chemicals and pesticides research from the impact report. And then uh, we're going to wrap things up this year um, for our funding year um, by sharing a lot of the hallmark features from the Children's Environmental Health Center program. And all of our content, um, for those that are looking here at the slide on the bottom, can be found at that link, um, which is bit.ly backslash CEHC toolkit. Um, and so just to share a, a brief example of what this looks like um, and some of the impact that we've had, um, at the top of this slide, you can see one of the spreadsheets that we send out with the content below that, what it looks like online, and then um, some of the traction that our work has got on social media. And so for those that are new to social media, um, this is looking at a, some data from Twitter. Um, and a Twitter impression, if, if you're not, if you're new to this, is essentially you can think of that as um, the number of times that the information uh, come across on someone's feed, or in other words, the number of times that they've had the opportunity to interact with the information. And so you can imagine with just a single tweet being able to reach um, almost 800 individuals, and then even taking it the next step further and saying for, for the seven individuals that this was retweeted by, you know, what is the potential reach and impact of sharing that knowledge um, just on that one social media platform? Um, and so that's, you know, just kind of an individual example of a single children's center. Um, we've also been tracking our progress nationally. And so uh, each month we're keeping up with how many centers and PACUs are um, using our content and disseminating it. And so this map, uh, the dots on the map represent children's centers or PACUs, and then the green dots are ones that are um, sharing our information on social media to protect, with the Protect Kids Health hashtag. We've got a number of other um, organizations that are related to the centers and PACUs, such as the P30, um, P30 Environmental Health Centers, and even some individuals that are sharing our content. And so 
what we found is that there's really a wide range of social media presence. Um, some of these groups are just getting started and might have uh, 10 or 12 followers, and others um, have follower numbers approaching the thousands. Um, and so by disseminating the Protect Kids Health content, we really feel that we're reaching a large and diverse audience with our posts, um, and hopefully we're getting the information again, not only just to researchers, but also to those that can directly benefit from the science. Um, and in addition to just tracking, you know, how many folks are utilizing the content and putting it out, um, we've also been um, documenting and observing a lot of uh, engagement among and between the centers on social media. And so um, that's really important to us because it's showing that there's a lot of power in this network to lift up the work that each other's doing. Um, and so I want to just kind of close out here by sharing a few additional resources that we have available um, that we hope folks on this webinar can take advantage of and let you know about some things that are coming um, in the near future. So we recently hosted a social media for public health communication workshop um, that focused um, on disseminating information on social media in the field of children's environmental health, but some specific topics included finding and developing a social media voice for effective communication. Um, we highlighted and covered some of the key components of a successful social media strategy. And then we also had a really great speaker who talked about traditional journalism approaches for translating research in a consumable format on social media. And all of this content is available. Um, so at the end of the presentation, I'll provide my contact information. And so our hope is that this is something that you know, groups that are interested in dipping their toe into social media communication um, can benefit from these workshop uh, resources. And um, the other two items that are in the works are a website with our content um, that we've curated. So uh, folks will be able to go to the website and pick and choose the content that we've created based on um, an exposure or a health outcome. All of the content, by the way, um, well, I would say 90% of it's derived from the impact report and faculty from the centers and PESUs um, peer review all of our content before we put it out. And then the last thing that we have in the works is a social media best practices guidebook. Um, and so this is a document that we're developing and will include resources on topics like how to define and reach a target audience, how to create a social media strategy, and how to translate existing research findings. Um, and there are, there are documents out there like this. Um, CDC has a great social media guidebook. Research Triangle Institute has one as well. Um, and so we definitely encourage anyone thinking about this type of outreach work to look at those guidebooks and, and get some great information to get you started. And then hopefully once ours is developed and published, um, that'll be a place for people that are really working in the children's environmental health space to get some more uh, specific content. Um, and then the last thing that's not featured here, uh, of course, is the Children's Environmental Health Network, um, Children's Environmental Health Day social media content. So if you haven't used that, I just want to put a plug in for that as well. Um, so lastly, um, just to reiterate again, um, the collabor collaborators on this project are Brenda Kester, Wendy Gutschow, and Roxana Chicas, and this wouldn't be possible without their support and expertise. Um, and we are here to help. Um, so if you're thinking about getting into social media work, please reach out to any one of us um, and my contact information is listed there. So thank you so much. And Ense, I am going to turn the, the presentation back over to you. Thank you so much, Nathan. Dr. Woodruff, Dr. McCauley, really appreciate all of you. Um, I'm getting notes and texts and messages from colleagues on the phone saying how strong they felt all of your content and recommendations and help has been, so, so thank you so much for that. Uh, we have a few questions here because I know people have to get to other things. Um, uh, there's a question about, and this might be um, Tracy, when you were talking, are there, are, and of course anyone can answer, but are there any House and Senate champions that one could lobby and that may have come in when, or actually, actually maybe it was Linda, when the discussion was being had 
um, actually both of you, about the lack of confirmed funding for the Children's Health Research, Research Centers. So for those individuals and or groups that are able to do so, and um, let me remind everyone who is part of a 501c3, uh, you can educate, you know, maybe you don't go so far as to uh, say asking for something, so again, uh, pertaining to whatever your parameters may or may not be, but if you can and if you still have room um, in your lobbying time, um, uh, for whatever your fiscal year may be, certainly we would all be very appreciative, I think, if you could add pressure. What I've been told is if you can call up your any uh, any of your you know representatives in particular, um, but we could probably get more information about who is you know a part of the appropriation process um, for the EPA in particular that helps to provide their support to the funding of the children's research centers. Um, any applied pressure, interest, um, you know, asking questions is always good. That has to be documented. But Tracy and Linda, you all may have other thoughts, anything that you're able to share for strategies for folks. Yeah, this is Tracy. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so first of all, we wrote a letter from the Children's Environmental Health Center scientist um, just to to, um, we are allowed to talk about funding for the centers and what's going on. We actually worked with our uh, UCSF, has their own congressional relations person, as well as the University of California, so um, they've been active on this. So we have a letter we can share with people that people can take to their representative, but the most important thing, um, one of the most important things is to talk to your own local representative. So each of the centers has reached out to the people that represent that are the representatives for their either their Senate or person or their um, their uh, uh, House representative. So that um, and of course appropriations is the committee that is going to decide that. So those are both important. Thank you. And then there was another question about um, any suggestions for engaging local OBGYN or ACOG who may seem reluctant or want to address um, certain prenatal exposures. And I mean, this could be one audience, but I think I'm sure we've all run into, you know, certain sectors or, or certain subspecialties or, or just interest groups that just maybe do not understand the full picture of, of what is happening and may question the science more than support it. Uh, so any type of, I think, feedback and, and best practices are always good. And uh, Tracy had provided um, a tool that they utilize uh, that may be helpful and provided a link there. Uh, but any other um, pointers or any other comments related to that question? Well, I would say that we there's actually a study showing that once people have read the committee opinion, they're more likely to um, be, um, I don't know, enthusiastic or engaged in this issue. So one thing to do is to share the committee opinion with the physician because ACOG is their, is their professional society and that's where they get all their guidance. So um, that's for that particular group. I don't know, and say what you guys do around this issue. Well, for us, it's always just kind of back to the basics, we call it, right? So we, we do, I mean, for example, we're working on cancer prevention work with some of you on this phone, and for example, oncologists um, or those that are maybe more on the heavy on the treatment side of cancer, uh, you know, no fault to their own, but that's how some of the framing is. That's their experience. There has been already some pushback, uh, you know, by them try, you know, being able to wrap their hands around some of the already existing current science does, does speak to links to cancer prevention and some routes of exposure. Um, so that's not to say that there isn't room for growth there, but certainly just what we've done is just start with the basics of bringing that science to the forefront. There's many different ways that can be done. Um, ideally, it's done before a face-to-face -face so that there's some room for engagement and discussion and ask, asking questions and having them answered and very strategically thinking about who you then bring into that room uh, that you believe could add additional influence. So these kind of position statements, these consensus consensus statements, excuse me, um, you know, these type of high-level documents that uh, have been thoroughly vetted by high-ranking, you know, very well-respected uh, health professional organizations is nothing but a plus in our experience. But then when you take that further and use that as one of many engagement tools in a respectful way, of course, in bringing forth information to at least start the dialogue, uh, I, I've had the same experience as you, Tracy. You may have a few outliers, but most folks, when provided the evidence and the time to digest it, the time to engage back and forth, the 
the time to go back to their various leadership and work this through, usually there is an, uh, an opening of opportunity there. It takes time. It's like any nurturing of any relationship, especially in many cases, what you all have seen today is still information, unfortunately, that still a lot of other sectors, even some of those in health professional sectors, um, certain subspecialties still do not have purview to or have had the time uh, or the direction, if you will, to, to do a deeper dive into it. So it then becomes our collective, I think I'll call it opportunity versus challenge, to become stewards of that information in a very robust, uh, meaningful, respectful, but of course science-based way. So this is Linda McCauley. I also find that um, it, it's important to, to work with our leadership organizations, our professional organizations, and it's also important to work at the grassroots level with students. I'm finding um, our younger decades of students, whether they're in medicine or nursing or other health professions, are much more likely to um, become active around anything that has to deal with planetary health. And environmental exposures and our planetary health are all related. And many times, students can be powerful in terms of molding expectations in the curriculum that they are being exposed to. And um, so I think um, never underestimate the power of, the, of youth to change what we're teaching um, because they see the world through a different lens than those of us who are older. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, and on that note, I will take the opportunity to just remind everyone, Nathan brought it up a few times, thank you. Children's Environmental Health Day is every Thursday of every October, which is Child Health Month. The Children's Environmental Health Network has helped to coin this as a time of action. Um, it's one day, we do realize, that, realize out of 365, but it is an important time to take a step back and really think about our own uh, journeys on this protection of health and how there's room for all of us to be a part of doing more assessing the work that we're already doing, right, and then thinking about what else can we be doing to take advantage of lessons learned, best practices, available resources and tools, some of those great uh, social media and communication tools and resources that were brought up in the final presentation. There's a lot available for all of us to be leaning on so we don't have to reinvent the wheel per se. Uh, you know, obviously doing better with our partnerships, engaging with our local community, uh, but we highly encourage all of you, go to our website, cehn.org. If you click on the Children's Environmental Health Movement, you will then see Children's Environmental Health Day. We are taking uh, partners who want to sign up, those that want to sign up and think about an action, uh, especially with youth and or for youth. Uh, as Linda said, uh, it's a great way to get the attention of those in your local community to understand no matter what issue you're working on, there's always a connection to children for the most part. So uh, I want to thank all of our presenters. Um, I want to thank Christy Truesdale for helping to coordinate uh, us all together um, and train us and get us going. And uh, we really look forward to he seeing a lot of you on our next webinar to be announced uh, soon. Thank you so much, and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.